Hey everyone, welcome back to the world of the Three Kingdoms and Zhuge Liang. It's good to be back talking about this subject once again. Indeed, we still have a lot to cover in terms of the historical novel. So far on the channel, I've already covered Kong Ming's ritual to procure the southeastern winds at Qi Bi. I've also covered his empty fort strategy, his straw boat strategy, his many inventions. I did a detailed analysis of his Longzhong plan. I also made a video on his southern campaign against the Nonmon tribes and so many other battles and stories. So now we come to one of my favorite chapters from the book. Chapter 43, Zhuge Liang debates with the Wu scholars. My good friend Carlos, a fellow student of Kong Ming, loves this portion of the book. I think it's great. I will be working directly with the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel. I won't be reading all of the chapter. If you want to enjoy the whole story, go and read the book. But here I will give you an abridged version of it. Before the great naval battle of the Red Cliffs, Zhuge Liang goes to Jiangdong as a diplomat. His goal is to secure an alliance between the kingdoms of Wu and Shu Han, effectively forming the Sun Liu coalition that would later decimate the giant naval fleet of Cao Wei. It was a difficult mission with incredibly high stakes. Due to the nature of the upcoming battle, and the fact that Cao Cao has far more troops, it isn't difficult to understand why most of the Wu officials favoured surrendering rather than fighting. To them, it made more sense to simply give up without the bloodshed and turmoil of a war they couldn't possibly win, or so they thought. In the boat, on the way to Sun Xuan's headquarters, Zhuge Liang is accompanied by a man named Lu Su, a loyal Wu advisor and historically a kind and benevolent man of upstanding character. To pass the time of the journey, they talk about current affairs. Lu Su, courtesy name Zi Jing, says to Kong Ming, When you see my master, do not reveal the truth about the magnitude of Cao Cao's army. To which the sleeping dragon responds, You do not have to remind me. I shall know how to reply. Oh boy, is that the truth, as you'll find out later. When the boat arrives, Kong Ming is taken to a guest house to rest, whilst Lu Su goes to meet with Sun Xuan. Sun Xuan was the founder of the state of Eastern Wu, a very powerful, outgoing and wise man, who according to the historical records, was a man fond of making jokes and playing tricks. I can certainly relate. Anyone who knows me personally knows that I'm a veteran prankster. So Lu Su finds Sun Xuan at a council meeting where they all gathered to talk about the situation. Lu Su was summoned forward saying, I know the general outline, but I want a little time to prepare my report. Then Sun Xuan produced a letter from Cao Cao and gave it to him saying, That came yesterday. I have sent the bearer of it back and this gathering is to consider the reply. The letter from Cao Cao reads as follows. When I, the Prime Minister, received the Imperial command to punish a fault, my banners went south and Lua Zong became my prisoner. While the people of Jingzhu flocked to my side at the first rumor of my coming, under my hand are one million strong and a thousand able leaders. My desire is, General, that we go on a great hunting expedition into Jiangxia and together attack Liu Bei. We will share his land between us and we will swear perpetual amity. If happily you would not be a mere onlooker, I pray you reply quickly. 
So you can see what's going on here. Basically, Cao Cao isn't proposing that Sun should join him to take out Liu Bei. He's basically ordering him to do it. I'm not asking you to help. I'm demanding you to. Whenever you see that kind of formal imperial language in the form of a letter, it's usually a demonstration of strong authority, which clearly Cao Cao has plenty of at this stage in the story. When you have a colossal army, you can throw your weight around. To his credit, Sun Xuan does not make an impulsive decision. He is uncertain about what to do, despite one of his advisors, Zhang Zhao, who has the opinion that Cao Cao is right and supports the idea of taking the offer in the letter. What have you decided upon, my lord? asked Lu Su as he finished reading. I have not yet decided. Then Zhang Zhao said, it would be imprudent to withstand Cao Cao's hundred legions backed by the imperial authority. Moreover, your most important defense against him is the Great River. And since Cao Cao has gained position of Jingzhu, the river is his ally against us. We cannot withstand him. And the only way to tranquility, in my opinion, is submission. As I said, the majority want to surrender and give in to his offers. The words of the speaker accord with the manifest decree of providence, echoed all of the assembly, but Sun Quan remained silent and deep in thought. Zhang Zhao once again started spouting off his mouth. Do not hesitate, my lord. Submission to Cao Cao means tranquility to the Southland and safety for the inhabitants of the Six Territories. Despite the pressure from others, he did not cave. Sun Quan remained silent. It is only when he is alone with Lu Su does he speak. He asks for his opinion on the matter. Lu Su says he is against such an alliance and tells him that Kong Ming has come back with him on the boat. I have brought back with me Zhuge Liang, the younger brother of our Zhuge Jin. If you questioned him, he would explain clearly. Is Master Sleeping Dragon really here? Really here, in the guest house. It is too late to see him today, but tomorrow I will assemble my officials and you will introduce him to all of my best. After that, we will debate the matter. And so Lu Su retires. The next day, Kong Ming is brought to meet with lots of Wu officials. Lu Su constantly reminds him not to speak about the magnitude of Cao Cao's army. Kong Ming smiles and says, I shall act as circumstances dictate. You may be sure I shall make no mistakes. For those who already know the story, as, as I bet most of you do, Kong Ming is basically walking into an intellectual ambush. He knows he is going into a situation where the entire room will be attempting to tear him apart, judge him, ridicule him, scorn him, just because he is an outsider from Shu, and the reason for this is because they are afraid of him. They know he's a genius. They feel threatened by Kong Ming's presence in the Wu homeland. Kong Ming knows this, and yet he still goes into the situation because he is well prepared and ready to debate them on every point. Kong Ming then goes into the lion's den, where he is sat on the guest chair, in the room where many Wu advisors, dressed in formal robes, wearing tall headdresses, clearly showing their high ranks and esteemed backgrounds. Kong Ming did not falter. The advisers noticed that Kong Ming himself had a refined quality to him and had an elegant manner with a commanding figure. Zhang Zhao led the way in trying to bait Kong Ming. He said, You will pardon the most insignificant of our official circle, myself, if I mention that people say you compare yourself with those two famous men of talent, Guan Zong and Yu Yi. Is there any truth in this? Kong Ming responds. To a trifling extent, I have compared myself with them. 
I have heard that Liu Bei made three journeys to visit you when you lived in retirement in your simple dwelling in the Sleeping Dragon Ridge, and that when you consented to serve him, he said he was as lucky as a fish in getting home to the ocean. Then he desired to possess the region about Jingzhu, yet today all that country belongs to Cao Cao. I should like to hear your account of all that. Kong Ming knew that he had to win this argument in order to stand a chance against the other advisers and especially against Sun Xuan. Kong Ming replied, In my opinion, the taking of a region around the Han River was as simple as turning over one's hand. But my master Liu Bei is both righteous and humane, and would not stoop to filching the possession of a member of his own house, so he refused the offer of succession. But Liu Zong, a stupid lad, misled by specious words, submitted to Cao Cao and fell victim to his ferocity. My master is in camp at Jiangshe, but what his future plans may be cannot be divulged at present. So as you can see, Kong Ming is always very good with his words. Zhang Zhao goes on to try and belittle Kong Ming for his humble background as a hermit farmer, and he also scorns Liu Bei, calling him a vagabond and an outcast, whilst claiming that he was worse off for having secured the services of Kong Ming. All nonsense, of course. Kong Ming responds to him, how can the common birds understand the long flight of the cranes? Let me use an illustration. A man has fallen into a terrible malady. First the physician must administer hashish, then soothing drugs until his viscera shall be calmed into harmonious action. When the sick man's body shall have been reduced to quietude, then may he be given strong meats to strengthen him and powerful drugs to correct the disorder. Thrust the disease will be quite expelled and the man restored to health. If the physician does not wait till the humours and pulse are in harmony, but throws in the strong drugs too early, it will be difficult to restore the patient. By using the example of the weak patient, Kong Ming destroys him. And I love the common bird's comment that Zhuge Liang made. How true is that? Kong Ming goes on to talk about Liu Bei's kind and virtuous temperament, telling everyone that his lord would never abandon his people as he is far too humane and benevolent. He would rather suffer with his people than leave them behind. After Zhang Zhao backs down, another person tries to question Kong Ming, the speaker Yu Fan saying, but what of Cao Cao's present position? There he is, encamped with 100 legions and a thousand leaders. Wherever he goes, he is invincible as a wriggling dragon, and wherever he looks, he is as fearsome as a roaring tiger. He seems to have taken Jiang Shi already, as we see. Zhuge Liang responds, Cao Cao has acquired the swarms of Yuan Shao and stolen the crowds of Liu Biao, yet I care not for all his mob legions. Yu Fan smiled in a sly and sinister way, saying, when you got thrashed at Dong Yong and in desperation sent this way and that to ask help, even then did you not care? But do you really think big talk takes people in? Kong Ming goes on to say, Liu Bei had a few thousand scrupulous soldiers to oppose against a million fierce brutes. He retired to Jia Qu for breathing space. The Southland have strong and good soldiers, and there are ample supplies, and the Great River is a defense. Is now a time for you to convince your lord to bend the knee before a renegade, to be careless of his honor and reputation? As a fact, Liu Bei is not the sort of man to fear such a rebel as Cao Cao. Once again, another scholar backs down before the sharp mind of Zhuge Liang. Another one, Bu Zi, steps up, 
Kong Ming once again puts him down with sharp words. But as one backs down, another steps up. One after another after another, all of them eager to question the crouching dragon, all of them becoming more desperate in their attempts. Xu Zong pipes up and asks, What do you think of Cao Cao? Zhuge Liang responds, Cao Cao is one of the rebels against the dynasty. Why ask about him? Zong asserts that the time of the Han is over and the mandate of heaven is being withdrawn from the Han Emperor. Zong believes that because Cao Cao is in charge of most of the empire, it would be too dangerous to oppose him. Kong Ming responds to him by questioning his loyalty. You would spurn both your king and your father. Loyalty and filial piety are what should shape a man's life in his time here between heaven and earth. You are a servant of the Han, and if you see someone abusing his power, you must help remove them. Cao Cao has turned from the kindness his ancestors received from the Han and the respect he therefore owes to the dynasty and has now become nothing more than a rebel. This has infuriated everyone, yet you, you suggest that heaven has now decided he will be the ruler. In doing so, you betray your father and your king and are no longer fit for the company of loyal men. Embarrassed and ashamed, Xu Zong said no more. Lu Ji decided to have a try by saying, Although Cao Cao overawes the emperor and in his name coerces the nobles, yet he is a descendant of the supreme ancestor's prime minister, Cao Zhen. While your master, though he says he is descended from a prince, has no proof thereof. In the eyes of the world, Lu Bei is just a weaver of mats, a seller of straw shoes. Who is he to strive with Cao Cao? Xuge Liang laughed and replied, Are you not that Lu Ji who pocketed the orange when you were sitting among Yuan Shu's guests? Listen to me. I have a word to say to you. Inasmuch as Cao Cao is a descendant of a minister of state, he is by heredity a servant of the Hans. But now he has monopolized all state authority and knows only his own arbitrary will, heaping every indignity upon his lord. Not only does he forget his prince, but he ignores his ancestors. Not only is he a rebellious servant of Han, but the renegade of his family. Lu Bei of Yuzhou is a noble scion of the imperial family, upon whom the emperor has conferred rank, as is recorded in the annals. How then can you say there is no evidence of his imperial origin? Besides, the very founder of the dynasty was himself of lowly origin, and yet he became emperor. Where is the shame in weaving mats and selling shoes? Your mean, immature views are unfit to be mentioned in the presence of scholars of standing. A voice cried out, Zhuge Liang's words are overbearing, and he distorts reason. It is not proper argument, and he had better say no more. But I would ask him what classical canon he studied. Yan Jun clearly is trying to back Kong Ming into a corner, but it fails miserably. Zhuge Liang says, The dry as dusts of every age select passages and choose phrases. What else are they good for? Do they ever initiate a policy or manage an affair? Yi Yin, who was a farmer in the state of Shen, and Lu Wang, the fisherman of the river Wei, Zhang Liang and Chen Ping, Zhen Yu and Geng Yang, all were men of transcendent ability, but I have never inquired what classical canon they followed or on whose essays they formed their style. 
would you liken them to your rusty students of books whose journeyings are comprised between their brush and their inkstone, who spend their days in literal futilities, wasting both time and ink. Cheng Jesu spoke up saying, You are mightily fond of big words, sir, but they do not give any proof of your scholarship after all. I am inclined to think that a real scholar would just laugh at you. Sugar Leong replied, there is the noble scholar, loyal and patriotic, of perfect rectitude and a hater of any crookedness. The concern of such a scholar is to act in full sympathy with his day and leave to future ages a fine reputation. There is the scholar of the mean type, a pendant and nothing more. He labours constantly with his pen, in his callow youth, composing odes, and in hoary age still striving to understand the classical books completely. Thousands of words flow from his pen, but there is not a solid idea in his breast. He may, as did Yong Xiong, glorify the age with his writings, yet stoop to serve a tyrant such as Wang Mang. No wonder Yong Xiong threw himself out of a window. He had to. That is the way of the mean scholar. That is the way of the scholar of mean type. Though he composes odes by the hundred, what is the use of him? Just like the others, Cheng had no response, so he backed down. Suddenly, the debate came to an abrupt end when Huang Gai entered the room. Alongside Lu Su, Kong Ming was finally escorted to visit Sun Quan's chambers, and so the great debate with the Wu scholars had finished. Thank you for watching this video. Again, if you want to read the whole story, go buy yourself the book and enjoy it. Oh, one more thing. If for whatever reason you don't like reading and you prefer to watch stories unfold on TV, check out this very scene in Romance of the Three Kingdoms 1994. I'll leave a link in the description below. Please check it out. It's brilliant. Take care and I'll see you soon.